Well, let's get right to it. I mean, there have been even just in the last couple of days, Biden sent another billion dollars of military aid to Ukraine. We had the European leaders, Germany, France, Italy, uh, and I believe it was a Romania who <laughs> went to see uh, to meet with Zelensky. I, I, so what do you uh, what's happening right now? Could you give an update about what the status of the war? Because we hear so many different things in the Western media, but the main line is kind of like, don't worry about Ukraine. Ukraine's doing OK. But lately there's been some uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's Freudian slips or just some uh, little indications that things may not be going so well for Ukraine. But I want to know what your opinion is on sort of the status of the war. Where are things? And, you know, wars are about winners and losers. So what's happening there? Well, I mean, first of all, we, we let's start off with what you said. Wars are about winners and losers. Um, yeah, in general. But, you know, sometimes uh, I'll give you an example. When Hezbollah fights Israel, uh, Hezbollah wins by not losing. Uh, they don't win by winning. Hezbollah hasn't defeated Israel and isn't going to defeat Israel. But Hezbollah wins by not being defeated by, um, by, by Israel. So when we talk about, you know, Russia and Ukraine, um, understand that the, 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 regardless of the rhetoric that you hear from, you know, Zelensky and his advisors, Ukraine is not going to beat Russia. They're not going to kick Russia out. But Ukraine can win this conflict by not losing. And uh, that's, uh, that's sort of where we're at right now with, um, you know, what the West is focused on. Uh, you know, they've been selling us a line of goods about, you know, how the Ukrainians have been killing the Russians by the bushel full and destroying more tanks than Russia is ever able to produce. It's all been lies. Um, yeah, the Russians are suffering casualties. It's war. <laughs> it's not just war. It's the kind of war that hasn't been fought um, for for decades. Uh, you know, we, the United States, haven't hasn't fought a war of this operational scale and magnitude since the Korean conflict. I mean, even Vietnam, uh, for its length and the and size, <clears throat> didn't have the intensity, the sustained intensity that uh, is is you know ongoing in Ukraine today. Um, the, the Russians are in control. That's the, the one thing that everybody needs to understand. Um, you know, the Russians have been very reticent about sharing information about what their goals and objectives are. They've put out some very broad brush uh, objectives, denazification, they call it. That ultimately is going to mean not just the physical destruction of the um, ultra-nationalist right-wing neo-Nazi affiliated military formations, um, but also the political parties um, and the ideology. Uh, Russia is going to insist on constitutional changes uh, in whatever form the Ukrainian state takes once this conflict is finished uh, that ban the uh, celebration of people like Stepan Bandera, who is currently the national hero of Ukraine, um, a, 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 you know, an old-time Ukrainian nationalist who fought side by side with Nazi Germany during uh, the Second World War, his troops are responsible for the slaughter of tens of thousands of Jews, hundreds of thousands of Poles, hundreds of thousands of Russians, because they believe they are the super race. Uh, the Nazi Germans uh, like the blonde hair, blue eyed Western Ukrainians. They called them fellow Aryans, and they actually took thousands of the of Ukrainian children and shipped them back to uh, Germany so that they could uh, improve the uh, the breeding stock of. Uh, of Germany. I mean that this is this is what we're talking about here. This is modern day extension of uh, the the Nazi ideology that um, I had been led to believe by history. Uh, my grandfather and uh, the the grandfathers of uh, the Russians and the French and the British had uh, united to defeat back in uh, 1945. But no, it's alive and well and living and uh, sadly uh, being supported by the United States, Great Britain. France. Um, it, it sickens me, to be honest, that uh, that this is taking place. But Russia has talked about denazification. They've also spoken of demilitarization, and that is um, any NATO infrastructure, any NATO, uh, any vestige of NATO, whether it be training, um, organization, uh, equipment, uh, will be eliminated. Uh, Ukraine will not have any vestige of NATO remaining. Their their military will be dismantled. Um, and cleansed of uh, all NATO-affiliated um, 
accoutrements, uh, all this equipment that we're sending in, the billions of dollars of equipment, um, will either end up being destroyed by Russia or captured by Russia. So the uh, Russian taxpayers thank the American taxpayers for, um, for gifting them uh, tens of billions of dollars of our most advanced weaponry because Russia will own this. And then the last one is, of course, um, that Ukraine must be neutral in perpetuity. Ukraine can never join NATO. These are Russia's goals, and Russia has said repeatedly, the special military operation will not end until all goals are met. And Russia's serious. I think the one thing we can agree upon about Russia is that they don't bluff. <laughs> there's, there's no bluff here. They just say it, then they do it. Um, it's called a special military operation for a reason. It's not a war. If it was a war, we would have general mobilization and millions of Russians, and, uh, and, and this would have been over a long time ago. But Russia did not want to go to war against Ukraine. They wanted to launch a special military operation against the Nazis, against NATO, and against those political elements in Ukraine that were empowering the Nazis and NATO. Uh, this was not intended to be a war against the Ukrainian people or the Ukrainian nation. Uh, the fact that it has transformed into one is the fault of Ukrainian government um, and NATO. Uh, you know, the, the provision of these heavy weapons are going to be a suicide pill for Ukraine. Uh, as I said, Russia is winning. Russia is in control. Russia has been dominating the kill ratio from day one. When this war first started, Russia was killing the um, Ukrainians at a rate of around six to one. That is, for every Russian die who died, they were getting six. Um, that number is up probably in the area of 15 to 20 to one. That is, for every 15 to 20 Ukrainians die, one Russian dies. Um, and this is good for Russia because the special military operation only came in with around 200,000 troops. Uh, now, Russia has suffered some dead and some wounded. The, the exact numbers are unknown, but I would guess that we're, we're talking in the area of combined dead and wounded, uh, close to 40,000. It's significant. But Russia has brought in 40 to 60,000 reinforcements. So their force levels remain about the same. Ukraine started with 260,000 regular forces, around 300,000 reservists. They've since then mobilized um, over 700,000 men. So, you know, there's a lot of guys on the ground fighting in a, uh, in a very large territorial expanse, but Russia is in control. They're grinding the Ukrainians down. This has become an artillery war, and artillery is the king of battle, and Russia is the king of artillery. Uh, to give you an example of why Ukraine will never win this fight, uh, one only has to realize that today Ukraine is firing about Five to 6,000 artillery rounds a day. That's a lot. That's a lot. Um, Russia's firing around 60 to 75,000 artillery rounds a day. And to put that in perspective, during the Gulf War, um, you know, when the United States put 500,000 troops on the ground, not an insignificant number, uh, the total number of artillery shells we fired during the total, uh, during all of Desert Storm was 60,000. So Russia is exceeding that amount every single day. It's a tenfold advantage over what the Ukrainians have, which means they're inflicting far more damage, far more destruction, and they're shaping the battlefield in a much more decisive way than the Ukrainians ever could. The Ukrainians have the advantage of extensive fortifications that they've been building up over the course of eight years. They're very good at building fortifications. So what they do is they will uh, defend a piece of terrain uh, for as long as necessary until they've built another defensive system behind and they'll fall back to that defensive system. The goal of the Ukrainians is to trade um, space for time, to trade lives for time. They're sacrificing men by time. By time for what? For them to uh, get this heavy equipment from the West, from the United States, from NATO, to get trained on it. And they're not being trained in Ukraine where the Russians can hit them. They're being trained in France and Germany, in uh, Poland. Now, uh, Boris Johnson just flew in. He said, we're going to train you in England as well. Um, so the, the goal of the Ukrainians is to reconstitute, um, you know, the forces that Russia has destroyed and make the pain threshold so great for Russia that it's not able to accomplish its mission, that Russia will have to sue for peace. That doesn't mean that Ukraine defeated Russia, but Ukraine wins in that scenario by not losing, by surviving. Um, and what we have right now is we have people in Ukraine and in the West who actually believe this is possible. This is why we saw the four leaders of, uh, you know, the French, the Germans, 
um, Romanians, the Italians, they, they go to Kiev, they meet with Zelensky, and they prop him up. They promise him eventual EU membership. They promise to provide more arms, and they promise to be there for him, to support him. Boris Johnson flies in afterwards, promises to train 10,000 troops every four months. Um, but this is all a pipe dream. Understand that all the equipment that NATO is providing today, and <laughs> let's put it in perspective, uh, the Ukrainians have asked for 1,000 artillery pieces. The entire inventory of the United States Army and Marine Corps put together is barely 1,000. So we're, the Ukrainians are asking that we give them the equivalent of all the artillery in our arsenal. They're asking for 500 tanks. If you take all the tanks in England, all the tanks in Germany, you don't get 500. The Ukrainians want more tanks than the British and the Germans have. The same thing. And why are they asking for this? Because Russia's already destroyed the equivalent of that. And the Russian army isn't begging anybody for equipment. They've got it. So we're simply giving the Ukrainians equipment so that the Russians can destroy it. And the Russians will destroy it. And here's the lesson that comes out of this. Because the West has their little fantasy world. But today, or yesterday, I believe, uh, Denis, um, uh, uh, I think it's uh, Pushilin, uh, the president of the Donetsk People Republic, one of the two newly independent republics that are fighting with the Russians, uh, spoke at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum, which is an event on Russian soil hosted by the president of Russia. And I will guarantee you that he doesn't speak unless his words have been cleared by the Kremlin. And what he said is, one, the special military operation will probably end sometime by the end of this year. So anybody who thinks that this war is going to be over in a couple of weeks, a couple of months, no. The timeline set by the Russians is the end of the year, which means they're going to continue grinding the Ukrainians down. It's inevitable. The other thing he said is, if you think we were going to stop once we liberated our territory, you're wrong. Because NATO has provided Ukraine weapons. We no longer can just stop there. We now have to complete the mission. We have to go in and destroy their military. Um, and he also said that Russian cities will belong to Russia. And what that means is places like Kharkov, like Odessa, um, Dnepropetrovsk. Uh, these are where significant Russian populations are. The special military operation isn't going to end until Russia controls them all. And then he said, I don't think the Ukrainian nation will survive. Meaning that when this is done, Ukraine's going bye-bye. He also said that Zelensky will be arrested and tried as a war criminal. Um, and the, the thing about the Russians saying this is that unlike Ukraine, they have the ability to make all of this happen and it will all happen. Um, that's where we are today. This is, this is, you know, a, a huge deal. Um, NATO and the United States are facing the kind of moral and physical defeat at the hands of Russia that will probably mean the end of NATO. I don't think NATO survives this. That doesn't mean that they're going to dissolve tomorrow. But this, on top of, you know, I, I think people have forgotten that just in August of last year, NATO suffered a huge humiliation, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, and, and NATO was struggling after that. Who are we? What are we? What are we doing? And now they've stood up to Russia to be brave against her, and they're going to lose against Russia without even fighting. By the time Russia finishes this, Russia will have an army that's the most seasoned combat experienced military in the world facing off against NATO forces who are poorly trained, poorly led, and guess what now? Poorly equipped because they gave all their weapons away. So that's where we are in a nutshell.